Okay, we want to now work from that cellular level up into the tissue and the organ level of the system. We understand that the foundation of all of this is the skeletal muscle fibers and what's going on. Contraction is happening within the myofibrils of each and every skeletal muscle fiber. <coughs> so just a little bit by way of review, right? This, this is the critical part in understanding the muscle fiber, right? This image with the image of the sarcomere here and the five parts, right? Also, this image sort of summarizes what's going on with the sliding of these myofilaments, the shortening of the sarcomere, the band structures here. And then thirdly, here, the structure of the conduction system that's causing or signaling the contraction by the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we have, we have these elements then that are all involved in this, the actual contracting process. Now the structure of the muscle though um, is interesting as well. If we go from the cellular level up to the tissue levels here, um, in this picture you should be able to um, identify here the tissue and the organ structure of what we're looking at. And what, what you want to see here is that the individual muscle fibers are actually organized within the muscle into bundles. That's what these three white objects are that are extending out of the muscle structure itself. These, these are actual little bundles of many, many, many muscle fibers. This one muscle fiber that we we're looking at, you can see, is just one of many in one of those bundles. Now the bundle has a name. It's called the fasciculus. Uh, the term fasciculi, the, the title of this, the skeletal muscle is organized into fasciculi. That's plural, fasciculus singular, singular. So in this, you see three distinct fasciculi extending from the structure of the muscle. But if you look at the cross-section of the muscle, you see many, many fasciculi there. And how, what is it that organizes these into these bundles? It's fibrous connective tissue. So a very, very important element of the structure of the muscle is collagenous connective tissue that sort of wraps up and enfolds and organizes, if you will, all of the muscle fibers into little bundles called fasciculi. When I look at the structure of a muscle, let's say we're dissecting the cat and a muscle has started to come apart, I can see threads in the muscle, can't I? If I have a steak, I can see the threads of muscle, even in something like a steak, or if you've got shredded beef, if you just cook it down until the threads come apart. Are the threads that I'm looking at muscle fibers? Can I see the muscle fibers in the muscle? No, why? Because they're like microscopic. Yeah, the obvious answer to that question is no. You can't see a muscle fiber, they're microscopic. So what, I, what are these threads that I'm seeing in the muscle, in the meat? These threads are? Threads. <laughs> they are the fasciculi, right? The, I'm looking at bundles of muscle fibers, right? The thread-like nature that I actually see with my eyes are these fasciculi. If I take a single thread out of a piece of meat and put it under the microscope, I'm going to see it's chock full of individual microscopic muscle fibers. 
Okay, does this make sense? Right? So it looks, muscle tissue looks very thread-like, but it's not the muscle fibers I see, it's the bundles that I see. And all, all muscle is organized in this way, organizes its muscle fibers into little packets, into little bundles that we call fasciculi. Now you have another picture that shows you kind of an ex, a blown up version of this. It looks like this, right? And as you look at this now, you're looking at the whole muscle. And so this is early in the chapter. Go toward the front of this chapter if you want to find this picture. 281. Okay, this is page 281. What are the sort of brownish-orange objects that you see here in the picture? Are these myofibrils? What are these, what are these right here, these brownish-orange things that you see here? Muscle fibers, exactly. But could this look like a muscle fiber with myofibrils? Yeah. You see what I'm saying about you've got to look at this, you've got to study this. It's very easy to get lost. It's tubes, it's myofibrils inside of muscle fibers, inside of fasciculi, inside of muscles. It's tubes inside of tubes. It's very easy if you, if it, you, know, if you haven't studied well, if you haven't spent some time with this, it gets hazy, and all of a sudden you don't know if you're looking at muscle fibers inside of or myofibrils inside of muscle fibers or muscle fibers inside of fasciculi. Okay, so be careful with this. Yes, these are muscle fibers here. And these rounded groups of muscle fibers are the fasciculi. Right? <clears throat> so you can see that um, there's connective tissues in, inside the light blue and the dark blue, all the sort of bluish color here is all um, connective tissues, other than maybe the vein. You can see there's arteries and veins here, but other than the veins that are blue, all of the other basic blue color here, or gray color, is all connective tissue that is bundling all of this together. They are, the connective tissues are a little thick here. They've sort of exaggerated them to make them more obvious. And, and you see that there are nerves and blood vessels here that weave the, their way through the muscle. Obviously, all of these muscle fibers need the nutrition and oxygen that's supplied by the cardiovascular system. We saw how the nerves interact, connect to the muscles, cause them to contract. So the muscle itself, the muscle itself has many, many tissues in it, right? When we talk about muscle tissue, we're, we're typically talking about groups of muscle fibers, but when we start adding all that there is in a muscle, nerve tissues and blood vessels with epithelial tissues in them and connective tissues, when we start adding that all together, the muscles are the organs Okay, muscles are the organs of the muscles, muscular system. Many, many tissues involved here. Now, the connective tissues that we were just talking about <clears throat> have names within the muscle. Okay, so there are several different kinds of connective tissue, or actually it's all basically the same kind, but different locations. They're labeled, the, the connective tissues are labeled by where they're located within this organizational scheme. So, for example, let's look at endomyseum. Endomyseum is the term that we give to the connective tissues inside the fasciculus. And that endo part there it gives you the concept of inside of something, endo. Endomyseum is the very light blue connective tissue that you see inside the fasciculus here. The second term that you want to know is perimyseum. Perimyseum is a layer of connective tissue like this gray one right here that surrounds a fasciculus and makes it into a bundle. 
That's what makes it into a bundle. So there's a distinct layer that, that bundles these all together. That's called perimyzeum. The little prefix peri means around something. Like a periosteum is that layer of connective tissue around the outside of the bone. Right? Perimyzeum here is the one around the fasciculus. Notice that both terms here have their reference as the fasciculus itself. Right? Inside, literally inside the fasciculus or around the fasciculus. The third term is somewhat similar, but it refers to the connective tissues around the entire muscle. This is the one that we call epimyzeum, the darker blue here that surrounds the entire muscle is what we would refer to as epimyzeum. Oh, uh-oh, why did I write that again? Sorry, <laughs> don't look at that. Okay, that should be EPI. Not, I don't know why I wrote endo twice. I was in a hurry. Okay, the third one here should say E-P-I-M-Y-S-E-I-U-M. Epimyzeum. Got to fix that one. Okay, so that's epimyzeum. So endomyzeum, perimyzeum, epimyzeum, connective tissues that create the structure of the muscle, that bundle the muscle fibers into fasciculi and all of the fasciculi together into a whole muscle. This is why when we go dissecting, a whole muscle stands together. It's really made of all these little threads, but it stands together as a muscle because there are these layers of connective tissue holding it together. If you break through its surface, through its epimyzeum, then you get all these little threads. But all those little threads are fasciculi, again, bundled with connective tissues. Now, all of these connective tissues then run completely through the muscle. And if you get to the ends of the muscle fibers, if you run out of muscle fibers, you don't run out of connective tissue. All of that connective tissue continues past the muscle forming the connecting links between the muscles and the bones, right? If you look at this picture right here, okay, you see here's the biceps brachy muscle and the triceps brachy muscle. You see all the fasciculi in here. Whenever you're looking at the thread-like nature of a muscle, it's fasciculi. And the muscle fibers are this long, Right? But when you, run, when you get to the ends of the muscle fibers, you don't run out of connective tissue. All that connective tissue that's running through the muscle continues and just condenses into a cord that then anchors that muscle to the bone. So I've got connective tissue running all the way through here from bone to bone. And it just weaves itself through all of the muscle fibers. This is what really gives the muscle its strength and its its. Um, when it's not contracting, there's still a tensile strength because of the weaving of all these connective tissues through. Okay? So you want to see the relationship between the muscle fibers and their connective tissues in the formation of a muscle. Good? Questions about the fasciculi? Let's, let's continue down your list. As you go down your list... Um, you want to make sure that you're familiar with these terms as they relate to the whole muscle. Now we're sort of at the organ level of, of the whole muscle itself. You already have learned what an origin and an insertion is, right? Origin is what? How would you define it? Uh, right? It's the end of the muscle that's anchored to something, right? I don't see movement occur typically at the origin. The insertion is the end of the muscle that's attached to the bones that are moving. <coughs> this would be considered the origin up here. This would be considered the insertion down here. Likewise, in this tricep muscle, origin would be up here. Insertion would be down here. The belly of the muscle is just a term that we use for the thick, fleshy portion where most of the muscle fibers are. 
It's just referred to as the belly of the muscle. And the tendon is the cord-like feature that anchors a bone to a muscle. So whenever you have a cord-like connective tissue, uh, we call it a tendon. There's also a structure called an aponeurosis. I always think this is such a funny word because it looks like it belongs in the nervous system, but it's not. It's, again, connective tissue, but this being a, the term for a sheet-like piece of connective tissue, as in that palmar aponeurosis. Remember that? We just did that. The palmar aponeurosis. There are other places. If you remember dissecting the sartorius and gracilis in the cat, right? The, the muscle didn't run into a cord. It was a sheet-like muscle and it had a sheet-like piece of connective tissue anchoring it. That would be referred to as an aponeurosis. Yeah, the belly is the main fleshy portion of the muscle. Everybody clear on these? This aponeurosis isn't in your list. You'll have to add that one. But make sure you know the definition of that as well. Everybody okay with that? Good? Right? It's just, it again is a connecting link between a bone and a muscle, but it's sheet-like instead of cord-like. It's like a sheet, you could say it's a sheet-like tendon. Oh, yeah. Uh, deep fascia is really just a reference to all of the, if the connective tissue around a muscle becomes heavy enough, um, then we think of it as deep fascia. Uh, loose connective tissue usually isn't called fascia, but heavier connective tissue is. Um, basically, it, it just makes reference to the fact that we have a superficial fascia all over our body. The dermis of our skin is a dense piece of dense fibrous connective tissue. And when they talk about connective tissues just generally in the body, the superficial fascia is the part in the skin, and the fascias that are associated with the muscle are called deep fascias. So sometimes you'll see a muscle and it'll look silvery or shiny. Um, on many cats, the rectus femoris almost looks like it's got a real shiny coating to it. It's just if the connective tissue gets thick enough, it starts reflecting light and has that silvery sort of appearance to it. So that's the reference to deep fascia. Okay, now a couple, of the two other items that we want to deal with here are um, what we call skeletal muscle nomenclature. How do we name muscles? When you start studying this list, one of the most important things you can do as you're learning names is say to yourself, why did they name it that? Right? Yes, these are Latin words and people struggle with them. But once you learn why, um, the name is what it is, things start falling into place. It's much easier to remember something that makes sense than something that doesn't. Right? So your book lists seven um, characteristics. That's what I was looking for. Seven characteristics that are used to name muscles. And let's look at those. The first one is location. Okay, sometimes a muscle is simply named for where it's located. Can you think of any muscles like that? Uh, biceps is not a location. Now, if you do biceps, what's the second word? Biceps brachy versus biceps femoris, right? Brachy is a location name. The brachium is the, is the term for the upper arm. Femoris tells you it's in the thigh, right? So many times the name of a muscle has meaning because it tells you where it's located, its location. The, in the 
uh, extensor carpi or flexor carpi, the radialis or ulnaris term tells you where it's located on the forearm. Is it on the lateral side or the medial side? They probably could have gone flexor carpi lateralis or flexor carpi medialis, but they chose to use the bone as the lateral medial reference. So if, as you look down through your muscle list, you ought to be able to pick out bones that are telling you their name based on where they're located. Uh, a second term is the size of the muscle. We had a good example with that with the gluteus family. Remember the gluteus family? Yeah, maximus, medius, minimus was telling us the si relative size of the muscles. <coughs> Many times the size of the muscle is used as part of the name. The shape of the muscle is sometimes used. We have several examples of that in the upper limb area. Do you know any muscles that are named for their shape? Trapezius is named for a trapezoid. Any others, what? Rhomboidius, any mathematicians here? You know what a rhomb rhombus is? What shape is a rhombus? I heard it. Say it loud. Diamond. It's a diamond shape. So there, rhomboidius, if you look closely at it, has a diamond shape to it. Any others? Deltoid. What's the shape of a delta? A triangle, right? A river delta, when a river comes to an ocean, typically all the silt that it carries kind of spreads out and you get this sort of triangular shape of the river as it meets the ocean. Or some airplanes they call delta, or delta airlines uses a triangle. It all comes from the Greek, right? If, if you look at the Greek alphabet, it goes alpha, beta, uh, delta, epsilon, eta, theta. But the delta, when, when Greek people draw a letter D, they draw a triangle. That's the capital D in the Greek alphabet. And so delta, if you look at the muscle here on the shoulder, it's wide at the top and it comes to a point. It's a triangle upside down, right? Um, you'll see the word teres from time to time. That's referring to the shape of a cylinder. Teres is a cylindrical shape. Okay, what's another one? Another one is the orientation of the fasciculi. Now, you know that's the threads. When you look at muscles, sometimes the threads of the muscles, the fasciculi run straight through the muscle. Sometimes they run at an angle. Um, look at the muscles. If you look at the picture of the muscles over on the side, look at the muscles on the side of the torso. See how the threads run angularly there? Those muscles, we'll learn those in our next unit, those are called the obliques. And the oblique term is meaning that the, ang the fasciculi are running on an angle. Um, one of the other terms that we see over and over again is the term rectus, right? As in rectus femoris. That's telling you that the fibers are running straight through the muscle. Okay, rectus is straight. Uh, when you look at the front of the thigh, you can see that the vastus lateralis and vastus medialis muscles kind of have fasciculi that are oblique, whereas the rectus femoris has straight, fibers are running straight through the thigh. So uh, orientation of fasciculi sometimes pops up as a term Origins and insertions. We saw that when we were looking at the forearm here. If it says carpi, you know it goes to metacarpals. If it says digitorum, you know it's attaching to fingers or toes. If it says pollicis, you know it goes to the thumb. Those features in the name meaning the insertion of the muscle. Some muscles even name their origin and their insertion, like brachioradialis. Runs from the bone in the brachium to the radius. So you can, you can see a number of muscles that actually tell you either where they're originating 
or where they're, where they're inserting. There's a muscle you're going to learn called coracobrachialis. Guess what the origin of that is? Coracoid process, right? And I know it inserts on the humerus, which is the bone in the brachium, right? So it tells me the origin and the insertion. Maybe not in, in great detail, but the insertion in, at least generally. Okay, a sixth one. Sometimes the name tells me how many origins there are to the muscle or how many heads. When we say heads of a muscle, we're referring to its origin. And we've got two good examples of that. In the upper limb, the biceps refers to the fact that it has two origins. Triceps muscle, the fact that it has three origins. And then finally, the, the seventh term that they give us is the function. Some muscles tell us what they do, as in pronator teres, or supinator muscle, or flexor this, or extensor that. In the lower limb, we had muscles called adductor magnus, adductor longus. The adductor term was the functional term. So some muscles are named for function. Now, this would be, here would be a good exercise if you would take your muscle list and go right down through all of the names and look at each and every word in the name of a muscle and say, which of these seven categories does that word fall in? Because I am very likely to say, which of the following muscles is named for its shape? Which of the following muscles is named for its origin? Which of the following muscles is named for its function? Okay, and I would be using, in my examples, I would be using the muscles on this list. What? A, B, C, D. Yeah. Yeah, multiple choice. Yeah, these are multiple choice questions. Yep, multiple choice. The answer is always staring right at you, isn't it? Okay, so <clears throat> make sure that you can relate any, any word in any one of these, right? You might want to try that between now and Friday and maybe after the quiz on Friday if you have any that are a puzzle to you. We could uh, answer those for you right then, okay? All right, the, the last element here that deals with muscles is the group actions. Um, 99.9% .9 of the time, muscles do not function alone. Your brain is constantly coordinating many, many muscles to produce any one action. If you raise your arm, you know, that isn't the, that isn't the result of one muscle doing that work. That's a result of many muscles in cooperation performing that function. And as you start stepping up to looking at flexing and extending and abducting and adducting and all of that, and you start talking about what muscles do what within that, you want to have just a short set of terms related to that. The first term that is listed there and the one that you want to be able to use is what is known as the prime mover. Um, a very simple example of this would be, let's, let's describe flexing of my cubital joint here. Okay, This is flexing my cubital joint. Now, which muscle in and around this area would likely be the most important muscle for that action. If I'm doing this, which muscle is primarily responsible for that? The what? The biceps brachii, right? This muscle here on the anterior side of my arm is attached to that bicipital tuberosity, and when this contracts, the forearm comes up and the joint is flexed. I would refer to the biceps brachii as the prime mover when I'm talking about flexing my cubital joint. 
the muscle that we see as the one most important or taking most of the work in doing that action is going to be the prime mover. Now, very likely, there will be a number of muscles that are helping the prime mover. These muscles are known as synergists. So, for example, again, using this example of flexing my cubital joint, yes, the biceps brachii is the prime mover, but there are two other muscles that are assisting, that are doing the exact same thing and helping with this action. One of those muscles is called the brachialis. It hides kind of underneath the biceps so it doesn't get all the press. It doesn't get all the attention that the bicep muscle does. But it's still sizable and does a lot of work. Um, the biceps primarily is anchored to the radius. The brachialis muscle, the synergist here, is attached to the ulna. So together they grab both bones and perform this flexing of the cubital joint. The third muscle that would be involved here is that odd muscle we called brachialis. I'm sorry, brachioradialis. Brachioradialis. That muscle, one of the unique differences for that muscle is, unlike most muscles in the forearm that anchor into the hand, this one does not. Its distal attachment is on the styloid process of the radius. So it doesn't cross any of these joints. Most of the muscles in my forearm are working my wrist, my fingers, my thumb. The only joint that the brachioradialis crosses is my cubital joint. And so, being that it's right here, it is also part of this flexing action. So I would say the biceps brachii was the prime mover, and brachialis and brachioradialis were two synergists. You might do this. If, if you've got your piece of paper there, you might write flexing the cubital above it and then list the muscles that we're talking about here. Biceps brachii, synergist being brachialis or brachioradialis. The next term that we use for muscles in and around the area that are involved would be the term antagonist. What do you think this muscle might be? one that does the opposite of this, right? The opposite. So if I'm talking about flexing here, what muscles oppose that action? The triceps brachy muscle, right? Which is the extensor muscle here, would be working against the bicep muscles. So antagonists are muscles that are working counter to whatever it is we're talking about. In this case, I would say it's the triceps brachii. And the triceps has a partner, too, a little muscle called anconeus down here near the elbow, or anconeus, some people say. No, that's, that's a second antagonist, right? That's a second antagonist. I've got my one, my typical one prime mover, and then perhaps several synergists and perhaps several antagonists. The fourth term that you have in your list, the term fixator, is simply a muscle that just tightens enough that it stabilizes other things in the area. Um, like if I'm doing this, I might be using muscles up here to stabilize my shoulder so I can effectively do this with my elbow. Or I've got maybe my pronators and supinators here are going to tighten at the same time so that my arm doesn't flip-flop while I'm flexing here. So fixators are typically just muscles that hold on and stabilize other areas or other parts nearby. Is there a fixator for <clears throat> yeah, we could say pronators and supinators would be here. The fixator is more of a general term. I'm not going to ask you to give me examples here. But I am going to give you this one simple example, and I may ask you questions related to this example. This should be, if you really, if you're going to be into physical therapy and stuff like that, you'd go far beyond into the kinds of prime movers and antagonists and, you know, those muscles everywhere. 
But here, if we're working right here with the upper limb, you can see how all of these muscles then take their roles based on the fact that we're talking about flexion, right? Now notice what happens if we change the action. Let's now describe extension of the cubital joint. Now if we change the play to extension, now who is the prime mover? Triceps brachii is now the prime mover, isn't it? And is there a synergist? Who would the synergist be? No. No, Anconius, right? The little Anconius is then the synergist to the new prime mover. See how this works? The, the whole focus is on what is the action and what role do the muscles play in the action that we're describing. Who would be the antagonist to this extension? Biceps brachii, brachialis, and brachioradialis. All three are antagonists because they're all flexors. So they're all antagonists. Okay? So we use these. You have to start with which movement are we talking about, and then what role do the muscles play, and these are the roles that they play. I often think that this is kind of like um, being in a repertory theater company. Um, typically you see these in the summer um, where maybe a, a group of theater people will put on three or four or five different plays day after day. They have a, um, over in Redlands, they do a Redlands Festival Theater every summer and they do five different plays. They do them on a different night. Well, they got one group of people and so the, one of the, any one of those people in one play, they might be the lead actor. In the next play, maybe they're the stagehand or the lighting technician. You know, each time the play changes, all the roles change, and people perform different activities in each different play. It's kind of what's going on here. I've got one set of muscles, but depending upon whether I'm talking about flexion or extension, they have different roles to play. And these names refer to those roles. Okay, got it? All right, any questions?